Hey everybody, welcome to Data Umbrella's webinar. I'm just going to go over a brief introduction. Um, so I'm going to introduce Data Umbrella. Uh, Rebecca Kelly is going to do her talk and then um, you can ask questions in the Q&A tab or you can ask it in the chat and I'll just move the questions over to the Q&A tab and uh, depending on how the questions come in, we can sort of, I might interrupt interrupt Rebecca if it's a good time to interrupt her, but we'll get the questions answered. And this webinar is being recorded. Uh, about me, I am the founder of Data Umbrella. I'm a statistician by training and a data scientist, and I also organize for the New York City chapter of PyLadies, and I'm on Twitter at Reshma S. Uh, the mission of Data Umbrella is to provide a welcoming, education, and inclusive space for underrepresented persons in data science. Um, and we are a volunteer-run organization. Um, Pi Ladies is an international group of Python ladies and gender minorities, um, and you know it's basically about Python and all, all things related to Python. Um, check check out our homepage and follow us on Twitter. I uh, just want to go over our code of conduct. Uh, we're dedicated to providing harassment-free professional um, experience for everybody, and please keep that in mind um, with uh, any of the chat messages as well. I uh, took a screenshot of some of the, the website for Data Umbrella has a lot of resources, and those resources include um, on open source, on um, sources for learning Python and R, about accessibility and responsibility in data science, and I encourage you to check it out um, later. Um, so for any upcoming events for Data Umbrella, the best place to find them is on the Meetup um, page. So if you just want to become a member, that's really the best place. Uh, we do also share them on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, so depending on your platform of choice, uh, that's the you know, that's, you can find out what we're up to via those social media um, avenues. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to turn this over to Rebecca and uh, let Rebecca sort of introduce herself and provide um, information about her background as well. Great. Thank you very much. Will I just take over the screen now? Yes. Okay. Okay, so can everyone see my screen here? Let me just, oh, actually I've lost the questions now that I'm in this view. Let me think. Mm, is there a way? Oh, maybe I can pop this out. Okay, we'll do that. Um, can you see this on my screen? Okay. Okay, because I can um, I can read the uh, questions. Okay. Me, so that would be fine. Okay. Maybe if you can um, interrupt me if there's any questions, um, just okay. because I don't think I'll be able to see them. Apologies. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, so, hello, everybody. I'm Rebecca. I'm very happy to be here talking to you all today about um, KDB+. Um, I work in New York myself, so I saw there was a, a lot of people in from uh, from local to me. Uh, so so that's great. Uh, you can you can find me on LinkedIn after this if you'd like, and maybe we can grab a coffee uh, whenever that's socially acceptable again. Um, so I'm based in New York, and I work as a technical evangelist for KX. Um, I've worked with the company for, uh, I was just actually chatting about this, I've worked with the company for about five years, started as a developer in um, KDB+, worked my way up to a solutions architect, uh, left, um, went back to college, did a master's in machine learning in the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, which was great. Um, and then I came back to work in New York as a technical evangelist. So I've, I've had a bit of a journey kind of in between then with the, with the company. I worked in a few different places um, location-wise, which was, which was fun. And I'll, I'll actually get into that a little bit when I talk about uh, some more about the tech. So the way I've approached it today, um, I did obviously, you know, 
look around and, and I, I saw that the mission statement for uh, Data Umbrella is to provide a welcoming and educational space. So I've really tried to focus on um, putting as much educational content as I can in into this presentation. So I'm hoping to provide a very good grounding on, you know, what is KX as company? What does the technology look like? Who uses it? What do they use it for? And then what does that mean for you? Um, before I jump into the demo uh, and the demonstration will do my absolute best to cover as much as I possibly can of this language, um, which is quite uh, quite broad. So, so hopefully uh, you'll come away with a very good understanding um, and 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 knowing where to go for more resources. So, KX is a division of First Derivatives. Um, KX is a software company. And our, the software that we produce is a high performance time series database. So we've actually been around for quite a number of years now. Um, we started in the finance space, so kind of, you know, fintech, um, and really kind of focused on the problem of how to deal with big data. So when people talk about big data, they tend to kind of split it into these, uh, the V's. So the, the, the four Vs, there's uh, volume, velocity, variety, and veracity is typically the, the kind of primary four that I think IBM first brought out. Um, and if it helps you to think about big data in that way, um, then you know the, the place that we work in would be the, the high volume and high velocity space. So anywhere where there's huge amounts of data coming at you very, very quickly is where we would typically, um, where our technology is most commonly used. <clears throat> well, we did start in finance. Um, that's not uh, that's not the only place we operate now. Um, we've actually been doing a lot of work in other verticals. So some of the ones that we've probably gotten the most uh, traction with would be um, IoT and manufacturing. Uh, so. I've kind of kept the focus on finance for a lot of this presentation because it being New York, um, certainly for for us and the people that I that I work with in this uh, in this place in this time zone, uh, it, it tends to be a lot of, of finance related stuff. But like I said, we are kind of working in these other verticals, and it's actually really interesting to see the the the, the difference and the similarity between the data sets. So. If you think about finance, um, the one way in which it would be very different from something like IoT or manufacturing is the uh, the peakiness of the data, if that makes sense. You know, if the markets are busy, you get a very busy day, you have very, very high data volumes. Um, whereas in IoT or manufacturing, you tend not to encounter that same uh, distribution, let's say, of the data. <clears throat> the way in which they might be very different is that with finance, you can get downtime. You know, there's there's times when you're not, uh, you know, so like at weekends, the markets might not be open. Um, whereas in IoT or manufacturing, it's pretty much 24 seven. Uh, but they are united in that they have, um, tend to have, you know, huge volumes of data and very fast velocities. So you're talking about uh, sensor readings every, every like millisecond coming off multiple, multiple devices and kind of aggregating that together. Um, which is not so dissimilar to capturing all of the, the data from the markets and trying to action that in the in the finance space. So just to lay a little bit of the scene, um, the technology. So anybody who might already be familiar with a little bit, the technology will be may have heard people refer to it as either KDB plus, KDB or Q. Um, so this is my little infographic. You'll see I'm quite fond of pictures to tell, to, to tell stories. Um, it, it, it's this, and this to me represents uh, how you can think of the software. So KDB Plus is the database layer. That's where the data is stored on disk. And then Q is the interface around it. So that's a Turing complete programming language that you use to actually query and retrieve the data from the database. Um, and that's the language that I'll be showing you in the demo in a moment. Again, more pictures because pictures tell a thousand words. Um, I'm going to break down, I suppose, some of the key features of the language and uh, in, in a way that I hope will help 
um, understand how it might be different to or similar to other languages that people have worked with before. <clears throat> so it's a functional language. Um, that means that, you know, there, there's no, it's not write, compile, test. Uh, you're, you're actually working interactively with the data. Um, it's similar to, to, to Python in that sense, and that you're, you know, you can start with the problem, you can uh, code around it, you can work your way through it. And it's certainly, uh, I spend a lot of my time talking to the developers who actually use the language. And this is one of the things that, um, that, that, that they most kind of appreciate about it, because you know, if you're talking about working with big data and trying to work through a problem, it, it, it's actually quite beneficial that the, the speed of execution is, is, is short. <laughs> you don't have to go and take a big um, tea break every time you want to, uh, to, to, to run some code, for example. Um, it's a columnar-based database. So if you're familiar with other databases like um, MySQL, for example, those are typically um, although it's becoming more common that they're columnar based, but those are often uh, row based databases. Um, the main difference, I suppose, is uh, how the data is retrieved. So if you're working with a row based database, anytime you want any piece of information in that row, you have to pull the entire row back into memory. But if you think about big data and how people normally work with or use big data, you're not, you know, it's rare that you would say, give me all of the data. Often you, you're, you know, you're trying to filter it, you're trying to work with a subset, you're trying to kind of aggregate it, do all those things. So it's very common that you would do something like, I would like all the data on this date for the Apple stock, for example. <clears throat> so with a columnar database, that means you can kind of go to, um, so the, the, you know, you can go to the particular date that you care about, you can go to the uh, you know the 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 stock name, and you can kind of filter based off of those criteria, um, and then only pull back the rest of the data for the rows um, where where it's actually met your filter. So it's a much more um, memory efficient way of trying to work with these bigger data sets. <clears throat> it's very fast, um, and yeah, I, I like to throw this one in. I, I upgraded my car from the first version because we actually do work with Austin Martin Red Bull Racing. Um, so if you kind of think about the analogy between the, the two cars, that's kind of the, the performance scale that we're looking at. Um, it's concise as a language. So that's what this little target is trying to indicate. Um, now that doesn't really, that sounds kind of like a throwaway comment at first, but I suppose the difference is you're not writing pages and pages and pages of code to achieve a particular result. Um, it's often a case of you might write one or two lines. Um, and that means that, you know, you, you spend more time thinking about what it is you're trying to do. And when it comes back to, you know, supporting it or actually maintaining that code, um, you're working with a much smaller kind of code set, which is uh, often quite beneficial for, for, for these kind of systems. Uh, this is a table. Sometimes people don't know what this is. Um, tables are a first order data type in the language. So it's a valid uh, statement to say table one plus table two, and that will, depending on what you have in your tables work. Um, but this is really to emphasize the fact that the language and the software grew up being focused on the problem of data as a as not not just kind of a secondary consideration but as the the primary motivation for the software um so so tables are, are really uh, front and center um this is time and this is uh this is really about um i suppose the fluidity of it and being able to kind of um work between different times so you know data is is um difficult and complicated, but, th but things don't tend not to necessarily coincide a lot of the time. If we're talking about financial markets, you know, like when you get a trade, um, you don't necessarily have a quote for that trade at the exact time of that trade. So you need to do, um, you need to kind of recreate the market context by, uh, by, by, uh, by retrieving the, the quote that was present in the market at the time of that trade. Uh, that, that'd be very common, for example, for a lot, a lot of the people that use our software, they might use it for um, uh, quality of execution reporting. 
that's a very big one. Um, so they'll 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 need to know, you know, did was this the best possible trade price that that could have been achieved? Have we done the best that we possibly could do for our for our, our, our customer that we're executing on behalf of? So um, there are a number of joins in the in the language that are specific to time that are based around that. Um, I will show you the as of join when we get to the demo. But I suppose to kind of go the more generalized uh, side of things, there, there is a window join in there that will let you say uh, for every row that you have in one of your tables, you can define a specific period of time around uh, each of those um, records and uh, join that original table with information from another table. So for example, if you had a sensor reading, you could set a window of time, uh, maybe you know, 10 minutes after it, maybe five minutes before and seven minutes after, whatever you like, and uh, retrieve from another table, let's say uh, like the temperature that, that was present in the room at the time um, for, that, for that sensor um, during that time period. Uh, so it's really all about kind of context um, and, and time is, uh, I think, the, the ultimate context <laughs> without, without uh, r running the risk of sounding far too, um, too introspective, but, but th that's, the, that's the idea. Um, windowing is the you know, bread and butter of working with big data. You, know, you, you, you have so much data, you need to oftentimes uh, you know, work with it in these, in these kind of smaller time periods, being able to kind of chop and, chop and slice and dice all the data that you're working with. Um, so windowing is important. Uh, this is about aggregation, data aggregation, data filtering, um, all of those good things. Again, big data. So you know, if you're talking about petabytes of data, you're not going to have somebody there looking at it row after row um, because that's just not feasible. Um, it's not a good spend of anybody's time. So it's all about being able to kind of, to roll it up into the format that you that you want to see it in, the the, the kind of um, run the statistics that you care about on the on the subsets of data that you care about and 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 kind of continue from there. Um, so this is actually a little bit of an older reference maybe than than people might be familiar with, but this is a lambda here and it refers to kind of the original concept of a of lambda architecture. So that's being able to take the, the data from very first kind of point of ingest to um, being able to work with it in real time and then finally being able to work with it in its uh, wider historical state. Um, so that whole kind of idea of being able to, to seamlessly deal with the, the data in whatever format it comes in. Um, and that's something that I'll, that I'll show to you in the, in the demo, uh, how, how as a language, it, it allows the flexibility to, to do that, to work with the data in kind of whatever format it is you're getting it in. Um, the benefit of this as well is that, you know, you're not writing three different sets of code. If you have a particular function that you want to use with data, that you want to apply to the data, you don't have to write something special for, um, for if, you're, if you're working in, in real time, another for in memory, another for, on disk and maybe another for streaming. That's that's not something that that you have to um, to worry about. Uh, this is it looks like a waterfall. It's supposed to be a stream. I wanted to highlight the uh, the the streaming capabilities because I think um, for people who already have a good range and breadth of languages, uh, as as I imagine may well be the case with this with this group of people here, um, it is certainly worth highlighting the, the the streaming capabilities of the language because i think it's uh it's really a, a place where we excel um and where maybe there's not always a great fit with some other languages <clears throat> uh so i've said a few times about how great it is and obviously i would so uh this is just to say you don't have to take my word for it um we do participate in benchmarks um so to contextualize the benchmarks if you if you recall, I was saying that the, the the that we started in finance, and that I suppose as a software we're a little over. Uh, I think we celebrated our twenty five years maybe a few years ago. So that we're about we kind of came in 
to the the market as um, I suppose high frequency trading and all that stuff was on the rise. Um, and the situation that a lot of the financial institutions at the time faced was, how do I decide what software to use for this problem that I have? Um, and particularly when everyone is going to tell me that their software is the right software to use. Uh, so Stack is a um, it's a it's a group, an independent body that that kind of sat down with all these financial institutions and said, well, what do you care about? We'll define appropriate tests um, to 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 check all of these things, and then that will help you be able to decide which you know which which software fits your needs the best. <clears throat> um, so for us, the ones that we tend to really uh, dominate in, and um, where we I suppose see the most uh, use both in our customers as well is uh, in the in memory compute and massive data at rest. So as kind of expected. Um, so that, that's a, that's that's just to say you don't have to just trust me. Here's a quick uh, little bit of a whistle stop tour of some of our clients and partners. Um, I whoops, go back. It's running away from me. Um, I've had the fortunate benefit of working with a few of these. So up in the top uh, right hand corner there, ASIC, that's the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. And it was actually one of the first projects I got to work on when I joined the company. Um, it was great. They sent me to Sydney. I loved it. <laughs> the weather was amazing all the time. Everyone was lovely. Um, but but yeah, so, so that was a project where uh, it was the Australian Securities and Investment Commission who are charged with overseeing the entire market, really. So they get all the market data. It's such a great place to be if you're if you are, you know, if you're someone like me who just enjoys seeing that that full picture. Um, and it, we were working on market surveillance. So the company KX, we built, we brought in a um, and built a market surveillance system. So we would take all the data in real time and we were looking for abusive market practices. So there's a number of different, you know, the, the standard kind of alerts that you care about in that space. So whether people are layering, insider trading, all of those things had to be kind of codified and then, um, and then applied to the data. So that was great. Um, I've also gotten to work with the Austin Martin Red Bull Racing. When that was first kicking off, I was involved in the proof of concept, which was which was very fun. I got to go out and actually see the car in the wind tunnel um, and work with work with some of the team there, and that was that was very um, very interesting. There is an awful lot that actually goes on in 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 the um, in the Formula One racing world, um, and and a lot more. I suppose it's not really regulation uh, because it's not a government body regulating them, but uh, the, the the kind of group of all the people that work in that space, all the different Formula One teams kind of um, band together and put a little bit of, uh, they, they set their own regulations. Um, and it, it, it's, very, it's very interesting. Like, like, for example, they have a limit to how much compute time they can run. Um, so, so they can gather the information from the wind tunnel, but then they're limited with how much time they can spend crunching those numbers because they all got together and decided that this was, um, the good number that they were going to say, so however many hours. Um, so being able to run things uh, faster obviously meant that they could get more actionable insights. And it was just an, un it was an interesting case um, that we, I don't know that on paper anyone would really have expected um, as, as, a, as a good, as a, you know, a potential vertical, but now we're very active in the automotive space. Um, and then I know a lot of these others uh, from, from just my work kind of going around and talking to the different teams that are based here in New York um, and, and just checking in on them and how their how their systems are running and keeping them up to date with all the latest features and all that. So how is it used? I, I figured I'd put together a little word cloud um, to hopefully kind of highlight some of the, the ways that these clients are using us. Um, so let me see. Strategy backtesting, for example, would be a very common one for people who are uh, who are using us as a very big historical database. Um, so, the you know you have petabytes of data, you have a new trading strategy, but you need to test it before you deploy it. Um, so, so that would be fairly common. 
Um, a lot of analytics around, you know, uh, post-trade, pre-trade quality of execution, um, and just just in general for kind of ad hoc analysis and and and, and database um, database things. So I thought about what you know who all of you are in this audience and and what might um, what might make you interested in learning this software. Um, and I suppose the the one thing that I would highlight is that it is so frequently used in the investment banks and we have a lot of big hedge fund clients. So if, if you're somebody who's looking to try and get more like maneuver into a position where you're a quant or a strat or a financial analyst, um, this is a great technology to, to pick up to try and um, differentiate yourself from maybe, maybe other people that are also applying. Um, it's also, like I said, I find it particularly um, useful with streaming data. Um, and again, in terms of the effort being worthwhile for you, uh, rather than just picking up another language where you can write, hello world, uh, here's something that might actually um, help you be able to address different kinds of problems. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very interoperable. We have a whole team called our Fusion team who are dedicated to putting together these different adapters so that we play nicely with other technologies. Um, look, the world is a big, wide, interesting place and there's so much technology um, and, and really it's use the best tools for the job. Um, you know, for, you know, we're, we're not going to rewrite that prop in our, in our software. Uh, you should keep using probably Python for that. Um, uh, and, 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 and you should have that freedom. That should be something that you get to decide. Um, so it's really, it's really about, you know, doors open, come on in, um, and, and the democratization of data really. Uh, and then finally, I think time, the most important, well, in my opinion, the most important resource that, that I think we have as people is our time. Um, and you know, you want to make the most of it. Um, so this is this is a little infographic I got from Forbes that kind of breaks down what data scientists typically spend their most time doing, and this three percent all the way around to the end of this nineteen percent, so a little over eighty something percent. Um, quick math <laughs> um, is, is 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 spent on working with the data, getting the data into the format that you want. Um, that so that then you can kind of do the quote unquote interesting um, work of of you know building building your model, um, testing algorithms, doing whatever it is the kind of the value added step of your processes. So the faster you can get through that, in theory, the 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 more value you can be kind of continuing to produce. So it's uh it's certainly something that I like to um, you know try and try and speed up as much as possible. This is this is because I have a forum. So this is where I, I normally take the time to to talk about just kind of a little bit what annoys me, um, but mostly it's something that I see a, a lot um, and that I that I think you know whatever software you're using, whatever it is you're working with, um, you know there 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 are kind of good and and bad practices. Um, and something I see is that people will go to the database. Um, it, you tend to get it a lot in these kind of fractured environments. So. In the, in the top panel here, what I see sometimes is that there is a database administration team, and then there is the data analytics team, and they they maybe you know I mean they talk to each other they're they're fine everyone gets along, but um, if if you want uh, data to use for your data analytics, what happens is you get your extract from the database that the that the database administration team gives to you. They put it somewhere on disk and you work with that, you work with that extract. And that's, that's kind of just what you have. Um, but as a data scientist, I find that very frustrating because I, you know, you like to be able to test against other conditions, against other edge cases and in other situations. So like I might've taken all the information for Apple, but now I wanna check for Microsoft. And now I'm caught in, the, in a two week request response um, situation and it 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 
it annoys me. And also from a from a database uh, administration perspective, this isn't great either because you're um, you know you're losing as soon as you take the data out of the database and you put it somewhere else, you're losing data governance. You know that that audit trail for who accessed that data is gone. Um, so my recommendation, and now it doesn't have to be our database, but you know the best thing that you could possibly do to really empower people to do the best job they can is to give people that freedom to to work directly with the data and to um, to be there with it. So I will get off my podium now and uh, just move on. So I'm aware the audience here is is quite familiar with Python. So I wanted to particularly highlight um, the Python interfaces that we have. So we have two. And the one that I'm going to show you in the demo is going to be this one on the left hand side that we call embed Pi. So that's where it's, it's kind of what it looks like. You'll see I reuse this <laughs> pictographic technique of, of putting, putting the thing in. Um, but, but effectively, that's what it is. It's a, it's a queue process that's running that has a Python process embedded into it. Um, so they share the same memory space, and it's really very efficient. Um, and then PyQ is the flip side. So it's a Python process that's got um, Q embedded in the same uh, memory space. Uh, so the difference would be the prompt that you're working with. So with embed Py, the base language is Q. And with PyQ, the base language is Python. Um, and that's the main difference. Rebecca, this might yes. be a good time to ask this question. From oh, go for it. Would love to know the reason why Q was written. Were there some time series data access patterns not supported by SQL? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and yeah, I think that was effectively it. I think people got tired of trying to figure out how to um, how to stitch the data back together to get that context. So I, I'd mentioned the as of join, I'll show it in the demo. But the idea is that you can have one table, like your trade table, and have all of those um, different uh, times at which all those trades occurred. And you can just say, oh, give me the quote table as of the time in the trade table. Now, I know there have been that, that, that some of these capabilities have been subsequently added to some of these row based ones. Um, but but the, the, you know, performance wise, it just wasn't the same. If you're trying to make a decision about, um, you know, how much credit do you want to extend somewhere? That's not something that you really want to to leave waiting for too long. Um, you know, the, the, these are the kinds of things that can that can end up hurting you financially. The the, the time horizon of, of when you can get those answers. Um, and as well, the ability to to um, to chop up the data and bucket it um, appropriately is is also very uh, kind of fundamental to the language as well. And I, I, th I think that that has been um, one of the real drivers too. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was it was kind of a two pronged thing. It was being able to provide the kind of common analysis techniques that 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 are native in the language now, such as the 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 binning, the aggregating, the the time contextualized joins. Um, and then also it's the the speed at which you could perform those operations um, were, were kind of the two driving factors behind it. So how can we do these things firstly? And secondly, how can we do it at a speed at which this will be valuable um, you know, information still? Because any information has a has a Maybe not, maybe not, maybe not all information now that I think about it, but, but a lot of information has a, has a finite value horizon. Um, and, and certainly in finance, that's, that, that can be quite short. Hopefully that answers the question. I, are, there, are there any more actually while, while we're kind of paused? Uh, no, that was the only question. OK, OK, well, hopefully that answers it, um, and I'll continue on. Um, yeah, so Python has been an interface that we've particularly focused on because of the huge growth in machine learning and, and AI. We have um, a team ourselves in London that are exclusively dedicated to um, machine learning and AI and how how we as a software can, you know, provide, um, I suppose, the, the most utilities and, and guidance and, and benefit. To, to the users of our software um, in that space. Like I said, we're not planning on rewriting backprop and, and really the, the, 
the most fundamental step, I think, in, in terms of making that available to our customers was, you know, let's, let's get an, an easy way for people to work with Python. Um, and actually, you'll see when I get to the demo now, I think in a second, that I'm going to use the Jupyter uh, notebook um, kind of format that, that hopefully a lot of people here will be familiar with. And this is me, live demo. Uh, hopefully, hopefully not everything. Here we go. So, okay. I've got a Jupyter instance running, um, and I actually have the ability to uh, to run Q. Um, so there's a Q kernel available for Jupyter for those people that are interested in maybe getting this set up after. And when I when I go back to the slides, I'll I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we're available um, on Anaconda Con or Anaconda. <laughs> Anaconda Con is the conference. Um, but yeah, we're available via Anaconda. Um, and I think actually in the resources that I that I sent on that that I think was linked in the announcements. Um, is the is the link to embed Pi, and it goes through the um, the installation and setup. And there's an, uh, and yeah, hopefully that'll um, kind of help you after this if you want to try reproduce some of this. So um, the demo that I'm going to go through, I'm going to try and give you the biggest whistle stop tour I possibly can of the language. Um, so I'm going to sh show you, uh, I suppose the the basics of it as a as kind of a column based language and and really being kind of vector oriented it's quite like um uh, numpy or numpy whatever way people want to say it um and then you know when it comes to the, the table querying um i suppose again with the kind of python analogy it's it's it, you know I'll, i i actually do a comparison between um uh a query in, in pandas versus in um in our language uh we actually have an sql like syntax that we refer to as QSQL uh, for, for that. Um, I'll show real time. So uh, data that like working with data in memory, um, working with data on disk and uh, streaming data. And then finally, the Python interoperability. So it's very ambitious, <laughs> uh, but, 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 but hopefully it'll be a good um, introduction. So I was saying that it's like uh, numpy. Uh, it is. It's it's very much vector based. So in this cell here, all I'm doing is uh, creating a vector um, or an array uh, that I'm calling A, and then I'm just adding ten. And you can see that all the operations are um, are kind of pairwise out of the out of the box. Um, in this case, I'm taking the the kind of the vector B and the vector A, and I'm adding them together, and that's just kind of automatically working pairwise. So that's uh, that's pretty neat um, and useful in, in a lot of ways. Um, but moving on and actually getting our hands on some data, uh, I have preloaded some um, simulated trade and quote data. So this is what my quote table looks like. I've got my symbols, the time, and the, the standard kind of quote information. And similarly, I have my, my trades. Um, they're a pared down version because we don't, we don't need a lot to kind of go through this. Um, so in terms of how much data I'm working with, I've got about 5 million in quotes and 1 million in trades. Uh, I also, because I'm running this with um, embed.py, I've also got the same data in Python so that I can hopefully show a little bit of the, the kind of side-by-side -side direct comparisons. So just to prove they're the same, here we go. Um, the good thing is, because we're working in this uh, Jupyter Notebook environment, we can actually uh, we can run some cells in Q and some cells in Python by using these neat little um, magic commands. So I'm going to recreate a very common um, requirement for, for financial data, which is to create a, uh, a volume weighted average price, referred to as a VWAP, um, broken down for each of my different stocks. So normally people would kind of create this at the end of the day as an indicator to use for, for, some, for some different models. So if I do that in Python, you can see it looks like this. Um, now, obviously I'm very aware, I'm talking to a group of people who are quite um, Python literate. So um, any suggestions on, on refactoring this are very welcome, but this was, this was my attempt at, at, at doing this in, in uh, Pandas. 
Um, and here is the equivalent in, uh, in Q. So you can see uh, the SQL like syntax. So select the columns we care about, um, broken down by the columns we want to break down by from the table we care about. Um, to show some of the, so these items that are highlighted in green are some of the keywords in the language. So they kind of do as you, as you would expect. I don't think there's anything here that, that, that people are, are struggling with, but if any questions do just shout. Um, WABG is weighted average. Um, so yeah, so it's very easy to kind of get that same breakdown and just to prove that those are the same. Um, and a more complicated thing that I didn't even honestly attempt to do in, in Python, but, but if somebody knows this, please do send me on the code, is a time-weighted average price. So this is where we start uh, to kind of, again, just highlight that earlier, earlier question that somebody had, like, why, why was there the need for this? Um, this is an example of something that would be very common to do that's using time that maybe isn't as easy to do in, in other languages. So what we're getting or generating here is a time-weighted, um, well, the, this is actually a spread, but it could be, it could be anything, is, but it's time-weighted and it's broken down by, uh, by stock. And here's an example of some of the aggregations. So this X bar uh, function here is actually um, performing bucketing. So it's breaking out all the times into 30 minute buckets. Um, and then this is the, the time weighted uh, average uh, spread. So, um, so hopefully that helps to kind of um, highlight or, or make it clear how, how kind of time focused the, 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 the language and the syntax is. Um, but we do have the, the standard joins that you'd expect. So if we do have uh, this kind of reference table, like uh, this info is just giving us the full company names, we can use a left join and uh, append that information on. Um, but more interestingly, we have this as of join. So let me show you what this looks like. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm joining the trade table with the quote table. Um, and I'm doing it where the symbols match exactly. So if I'm looking at a trade in Apple, I, I only care about quotes in Apple. Um, and then my time column is going to serve as like a soft lookup. So I'll see if I can find an example here in the, in the, in the, like directly in the things. Okay. So if, for example, here, there was a trade that happened in Apple at 9.30 and then all of these uh, <laughs> nano milliseconds later. Um, that, that actually, that's another thing that we have native to the language that um, maybe not a lot of other databases support. It's just the granularity of time that we support. Um, but yeah, so it happened at this time. And you'll see that this quote information that has been joined on is actually from a quote that occurred uh, just like at one, um, one increment beforehand. Um, so while this was obviously very close in time, that could be much, much earlier in the day if you're, if you're looking at something that's maybe particularly um, illiquid. Um, and that's, that's kind of the idea behind it, being able to kind of bring that context in and say, well, this was the quote and therefore, um, therefore this, this works like that. So just to show the tables, um, the benefit of being able to do this kind of analysis. So now that I've made this table um, tack, that has my contextualized trade data, I can use that to perform different analysis. So like, like I said, a very common one is um, around the quality of execution. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna pull out all the cases where, um, where that price that I traded at wasn't within the bid or ask. So this is something unusual um, that really should be justified because you know, if it's outside the bid or ask, it, you know, there's a very good chance that this wasn't optimal. Um, in terms of its execution. And so that needs to be addressed for the clients. Um, the neat thing about it being a programming language is that you can put code kind of directly into your breakdowns. Um, so if you're used to maybe some other languages, you know, the, the breakdowns often have to be kind of existing columns. So this would be maybe a two-step process. You'd have to make the column and then break down uh, then do your breakdown on the kind of the next line, um, working with a new table. But because it's a, a full programming language, you can put kind of whatever you, you want in here. 
um, to, to kind of get your breakdowns. So here I'm deciding if it was a valid um, trade or not by deciding by checking if the price was within that bid or ask from the quotes. So these cases here where it's zero, this is a Boolean value, are telling me that that's not true. Um, so there was 84 cases where um, trades happened that were outside of the, the quote in this, uh, in this uh, stock. So that is where if I'm the person charged with, um, you know, uh, ensuring uh, quality execution, that's where I would be starting to, to look um, as, 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 as my kind of basis. Um, so this was a quick example of the syntax I was working with in memory data, um, but now we're going to jump to on disk data. Uh, so I have much bigger tables on disk. Now, having said that, I am just running off of this. Um, let me see about this Mac. This will tell you. Yeah. So this is what I'm working off in terms of my system spec. I'm not connected to anything else in the back end here. It's just my own laptop, um, and I have some. Some data in a database uh, that I've that I've generated that, that that's running locally, um, and in fact, I've got about 95 million quotes and 19 million uh, trade records. So I can show you what they look like. Uh, you'll notice that these are schema-wise. This table is the same as it was in when we were working with it in memory, with the exception of this new column here, which is the date, which signifies the date. So normally in a kind of a sta standard tick capture system using the technology, um, people would typically accumulate the data intraday in the in the in memory table. And then when it comes to the next day, they will um, they'll basically purge that, write that out to disk and then uh, start fresh. Uh, so just to to add a little bit of architectural context to it. Um, but we can do the same things with this data that we have on disk as we did with the in-memory data. So we can get a breakdown of, of how many, um, this count i is just going to tell us how many records we have for each day. Um, you see the syntax isn't really any different. Um, and we can actually run, let's run a, so another thing that people would normally do at the end of the day is you'd kind of create some summary statistics or uh, you know, from, the, from the trading day that just occurred. Uh, and it's very common for, for candlesticks to just create the, the open, high, the low, and the close, um, along with this VWAP here. Um, so we can just build that on the fly. So just a reminder again that we're working off of the, I think 19 million uh, records or something. And it doesn't, you can see it doesn't really take an awful lot of time to, to work with this, um, which, is, which is nice. Um, so now that we have this, data in a, in a daily format. This is exactly the kind of data that we might want to feed in to a model if we were trying to, to have a look at, um, you know, uh, beginning to understand the, the market behavior and, and where things are. So I can take the actual um, the series, so the, the, the end of day uh, VWAP for each stock and extract it from that table. Um, and get it. So this is a, a dictionary. So it's a, a key value pairing of, of the, the key being the stock and then the value being the, the, the price series um, for each day from the daily table. Um, if I want to just see it for one, uh, I can do that. So this is what the Apple price series looks like. Um, getting again to the statistics of it, we can look at how that correlates with Microsoft. Um, we can also I'm actually missing a bit of a line. We can check Apple against everyone um, with less code. This is actually, this, this is kind of our version of a, uh, it's one of our versions. We have a few different ways to, to do this, but it's what we call an iterator in the language. Um, and it's kind of, it's our way of doing loops. You know, you don't really write for loops in the language, you, you iterate over things. Um, so I'm, so what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're checking the correlation of Apple with each item to the right. That, that's what that's doing, um, which is our, 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 our price series for, for each of the different stocks. Um, and then finally, we can actually go even further and check the, so this is looking a little funny because of my formatting, but this is a, this is a table, if I zoom out for a second. 
oops. Yeah, so there you can see it looking a little bit more like a table, um, but I will, I will go back in for, for ease of readability now. But just to highlight that this is less code than when I wanted to just do it for, for the two um, individual ones, but yet I'm doing more. So it's um, hopefully a little bit of a peek into the, into the kind of elegance of the language, so to speak. Hmm. If there's no questions on anything so far, I'm going to jump into streaming. Um, and this is where, oh, there sorry. One question. Oh, great. OK. Uh, a question from Aditi. Is Q coupled with KDB, or can we possibly configure a relational database we already have to work with Q? Um, so there are different, you might have seen on the kind of fusion piece. I mean, you can use it just as a programming language if that's all you want to use it for, for sure. Um, we have a number of different drivers. So there's like an ODBC driver. There might even be like one or two different versions of that. So there's one by Simba and there's another ODBC three one. Um, there's a JDBC driver. So like if you're trying to work with relational databases, yeah, you can you can do that. You can um, you can do your extract from those and, and bring it in to kind of to this space. Um, and actually, the, the the working in Jupyter has been quite um quite great for a, a lot of our of, of our developers really because um the so I'm I've currently got the Q kernel running here with embed pi, uh, which means that I can kind of swap in in these different code cells between the two different languages. Um, we also have an interface uh, embed or, so that's uh, my accent can be a little heavy, but that's or for Romeo. Um, <laughs> Uh, if we're going to go phonetic with it. Um, so I mean the programming language. Uh, so so if you have both loaded into your uh, Q environment and you're working in Jupyter, you actually kind of have this this great kind of polyglot environment where you can have a cell in OR and have a cell in Python and then swap back to Q. And I mean, maybe 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 someone's worst nightmare, but but it, it, it's quite it's quite helpful if you're if you kind of like to. Um, use a few different things. Um, like I said, best tool for the job and all that. Um, so a question. So Q mm -hmm. is a language and KDB is a database. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, people tend to use them kind of interchangeably, but, but technically, yes. So uh, KDB plus is the, is the, um, is the database kind of so that, so that historical uh, data that I was looking at would be written down in in kind of that format. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to let you go back to your presentation, but I just want to add that uh, JupyterCon is coming up. So if you want to submit a CFP on how you use Jupyter for your work, feel free to. We can talk about it later. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I do. I do enjoy it. Um, I, th I think. I think it's great. It's. Uh, yeah. I'm going to start on a tangent there, so I'll stop. But but yeah, we should chat about it. Um, so yeah. Finally, moving on to streaming. Um, so you, we, we've already looked at this and, um, I had the, the 5 million quote, the 1 million in trade. Um, so I can do, you know, the syntax that you saw before. Um, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to subscribe to some data, um, in, on the back end, and you'll see that this is now changing. The number of, uh, rows I have in my data is, is changing as I get new data in to the system. Um, so I can still work with that live data, even though it's it's streaming and, and calculate these kind of uh, metrics on the fly. So I can get my total count broken down by each stock from my quote table. Um, and you can see that those are changing. So this is where I normally go into my architect mode and talk a little bit about um, good system design. Uh, so there's a very big difference between um, streaming analytics and kind of these ad hoc APIs um, when it comes to uh, what effect it has on the system. So I'll, I'll try to clarify. The quote table here that we have is going to be increasing as the day goes on. So every time you get a new set of data that's appended onto the end of your quote table and that continues to grow. So that means that when you're running this query, that's going to take different times to complete depending on what time of the day it is. Um, and even though obviously it's a very fast, very performant language, like, you know, this doesn't take really any time to do, 
um, if you have a lot of people working on the same system um, and, and wanting to kind of do these queries, then you know, that can sometimes become non-significant. And uh, you don't like that <laughs> if, you're, if you're designing systems. You don't like uh, unknowns. Um, you don't like not being able to you know, have things behave in a very expected way. Uh, so what we do in the kind of KDBQ world is we, we, we use streaming analytics. Um, so streaming analytics are really just getting to decide what you want to do with each bit of information you get. So if I get a new, um, a new quote message, uh, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a little mini table that will have some amount of quotes. So that could be one row or it could be many, many rows. It depends on kind of the upstream system. But um, I decide what I want to do every time I get that message. So that means that, um, well, actually, I'll just show you here. So I'm going to make a new streaming function and it's going to happen every time I get a quote message. Um, so this here, the curly brackets are the, is, is how you write a, a function in, um, in, uh, in KDB slash Q. And then this here is the, the parameter. So I'm saying that this is a function that takes a parameter Q and then I'm writing the code for what I wanted to do. So I'm going to create a new table called Q total. That's going to, for every kind of message I get in for the quote table. So that'll be um, a series of rows or one row or whatever. Um, I'm going to calculate this. So I'm going to get the total count broken down by each stock in just that message. So that could be like three Microsoft messages and uh, one Oracle and two IBM. That might be what came in in that bundle. Um, and I'm going to then uh, add that on. So this is an example of kind of adding two tables really um, that, that I kind of talked about before. I'm going to add that on to this Q total table um, so that every time I get a new message, this is updated. Um, so the benefit of doing that, just to show those two things are the same now um, and they will continue to be the same, is that this table here that I've created, this Q total table is small. It's got you know, a finite number of records because it's just based off the stocks I have. It's got a pretty well understood um, execution time you know, because I'm, I'm, it's, it's pretty small. It's not really going to, um, to hold up anything. Um, but yet, if everybody wanted to come and retrieve that from my process, that, sh you know, this is, this is, this is going to take, take the same amount of time, no matter what time of the day they put this in, as opposed to the first query, which will have, you know, different, different run times at the end of the day versus the beginning. So streaming analytics are, are just, uh, very, very powerful in that sense, in that you can control the system in a very, um, in a very, I suppose, discrete fashion. Um, and, and it does mean that then you can, that this is kind of the whole framework that we use for, for leveraging um, action and responses. So if I, you know, I could have something in here that would check if, you know, if the stock is um, Microsoft and if the price is below this, then I'd like you to go and make a trade. Or, or, or do something else. It's this whole kind of um, event trigger um, kind of paradigm that, 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 that you can then use, um, which, is, which is really kind of the powerful uh, thing with, with streaming analytics, in my opinion. Um, and I'm also just going to do something else here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to the trade table a summary that's going to um, cut, keep a running VWAP. So keeping a running VWAP is actually kind of tricky because you're... Um, you know, you've got to constantly be carrying carry forward that waiting. Um, and that's that's pretty easy to do in a, in a streaming fashion, believe it or not. Um, some things are obviously harder than others, but, but it's, uh, it's, it's really very powerful to be able to work with things incrementally. Um, so if you're interested at all in kind of capturing real-time data and maybe driving uh, analytics or decisions off of it, uh, you know, I, it, it is very fun to play with. Um, and it's pretty easy to kind of set up different, um, different connections. Um, the audience being what it is, I thought I'd also show uh, some Python integration because we, because we all, we all like Python here. So that's great. Um, so I'm going to build a time series. This is a little bit more complicated than the one I did before. So rather than getting just the end of day price from my historical trade 
table uh, for each, or, or my volume weighted price over the day for each day, I'm, I'm getting an even more granular time series. I'm going to get the, the kind of opening price in uh, 15 minute time buckets uh, for each stock um, across all the days in my, in my database. So this is built out that, that 15 minute um, uh, bucketed time series for, for each of my stocks. Um, and then I can import matplotlib. So this .p.import is, 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 is doing that. So I'm just saying .p.import, whatever the library is I want from, um, from Python. And if I, I'll show you what that looks like. That just says that it's this uh, module here. Um, and then I can use this kind of a syntax to, 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 to use it. So I'm saying I want to go into plot and the function I care about is this figure. Um, and then this P PYKW is saying it's a Python keyword. And I'm saying that associate the Python keyword of fig size with, with this input. So I'm kind of meshing the, 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 the Q, um, the Q uh, variables into the, in, but, but leveraging the Python library. Um, and then I just extract the time series uh, for uh, Dell and I plot my, my, um, my figure. So that's obviously pretty straightforward. Um, the nice thing about this is that I can then use the very Q-like syntax of, of wrapping things up in functions and iterating to, to kind of go a little bit further. So I start with making my, my, um, my kind of basic plot, set out the, the size and all that. And then I wrap all of this into a pipe, into a, into a little function. So this is going to take each of my time series. Um, like I said, they're a dictionary. So I'm pulling out the, um, I'm pulling out the price and I'm pulling out the, the, the symbol for, for, um, each of my, sorry, for each of my rows of my, of my table, um, and plot them kind of all at once. So that's the, uh, this, this each here is the, um, is, is, a, is another iterator in, um, in, in, in KDB. So it'll take any function and it will apply it to each of these. And, and this time series here is the, the table up above where I've got, um, the sim and the price for each of the, the different rows. Um, that, and they, those basically get passed through as a, as a, as a kind of a dictionary structure um into into this and, and then you can plot them all so that's uh that's a very quick whistle stop tour of the of the technology um i'll flick back to the slides now if i can yes um and just say that if it's available for non-commercial use so if you want to use it for your own projects doing whatever it is you would like knock yourselves out if you want to use it for academia absolutely we you, we have the citation page and everything feel free to um play around with it um and uh, in the resources that that were linked with the talk that you you'll see that there's um some guides on on doing this uh installation um and for those people who might be interested in in, in knowing more about this or kind of getting getting more hands-on um I, I understand that with the best will in the world, it's not always easy to, to self-motivate. It's certainly something I struggle with. Um, so just to say that we do have uh, free one day workshops that we run um, at least once a month um, in, in uh, pretty much uh, at least three major time zones. Um, but certainly in America, we have at least one a month um, in the US time zone. So um, for people that do want to just Come along they're free the the one day workshops the kx introductory workshops are, are free um and so you'd all be very welcome if you'd like to come and uh get get more hands-on with it in in a, in a one day training so that was me this is a picture of me uh if anybody wants to stay in touch please do find me i'm on you can you can email me here rebecca at kx if you have any questions about anything today or if you just want to know any more um i'd be very happy to talk with you and i hope that you found it um you know interesting and even if it's not something you want to pursue hopefully it'll it has helped uh you know broaden your horizons a certain a certain bit
Rebecca, would you be able to put the link to the training in the chat? Oh, yes. I'll do that now. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. So I might stop my screen share if that's okay, because I'm getting a little bit of inception. <laughs> um, and where I'll find this. Oh, I popped out my chat. That's my problem. Okay. Um, okay. Um, that's fine. Um, all right. Yeah, I actually popped out my chat and couldn't remember how to get to it. I am struggling a bit. <laughs> It's okay. You know what I can do is I'm going to upload the video later. And so I'll put the link to the training in there. So people will be able to get it. Okay. Um, okay. There is one more question, which is RQ and KDB plus open source and how are the requests for feature enhancements taken? Okay. So they are not open source. No. Um, it's actually a very, very, very small code base. Um, and the, so it's it's free for non-commercial use. So definitely do whatever you like in in, in your own time. Um, but yeah, it's not an open source uh, software. It's written in um, C, and it's all very very uh, terse. I think even I don't know. I've I've seen a glimpse of it before, and it did not look like any C code I've ever seen. Um, but in terms of feature requests, it comes through uh, us here on the evangelism team. Anytime people say, oh, we'd like to see X, Y, Z, we feed that back in to our, our core development team. Um, and we also have a, um, we have a number of kind of support groups. So there's a, uh, a well, support group makes it sound very dramatic, but there's a, a Google group for, for people that, you know, are, are involved with it or want to use it or have any questions um, in the usage where uh, a lot of our more expert engineers will kind of respond back. Um, and there's also, uh, we have a number of meetups and stuff. So we, well, in, um, in, in different times, <laughs> they would have been a much more frequent in person thing. Um, but yeah, we have a, we have different email groups for, for those and a number of different tools that I didn't want to kind of get into too much today. Um, but like a, a, an IDE tool and, um, a front end dashboarding tool, um, that are, that are also worth checking out. Okay. Um, that is, um, it for questions. Um, so I want to thank you first of all for turning off your air conditioning in the <laughs> to reduce the sound. <laughs> thank you so much. No and problem. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight and your presentation. It was, it was really great. No, thank, thank you all for, for joining. And, uh, and thank you very much for having me. I was delighted to come and hope, I hope it was helpful. <laughs>